Thank you, Chief, for reading my very humble, brief CV. <laughs> it's um, 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 a privilege to be here this morning and to talk to you about a um, project which is very close to um, my heart and to the Academy of Sciences' heart and also to the DST or DSI and the NRF. Um, so why are we doing Open Access, Open Science? And the theme for, for Open Access Week this year was Open for WIM. And um, it is a fact that we cannot talk about a democracy or a world um, in where, where all, if we all do not have access, equal access to information, to the same information. So as long as um, all do not have equal access, we're not a democracy. Um, information, the data underlying the, the information, the research, should be as open possible and as closed necessary only. We acknowledge that not all information can necessarily be open, not all data can necessarily be open, but um, at least as open possible and as closed necessary. There is approximately four hours between South Africa and one of the most deadliest diseases in the world. There are not many floods to that country, and the country I'm talking about is the Congo, um, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, there's one flight maybe once a week between South Africa and the Congo. Um, none to the rest of the continent, and even less than none to the rest of the world. Why? Because of Ebola. If governments do not contain viruses, they are being cut off from the rest of the world. What this means is there won't be a flow of people, no movement of people, um, monies that were supposed to be used um, to innovate um, is now used to contain that virus, something governments try to avoid because it's very expensive. It puts them back if they have to contain this kind of, kind of outbreak. Um, these are monies that could have been used to, to take the country forward, but now, instead of that, they have to fix their own problems. Um, but the reason I've put this map up here is because we are not isolated. We do not live in isolation. We are part of the African continent, and often, we tend to rather you, uh, work with Europe or with the US because it's more prestigious. While on our continent, we have unique problems which the Australians, the Americans, the Europeans cannot resolve for us. So it's a matter of Africa having to produce its own research output, publish it so that people across Africa can access it um, towards more collaboration. The more open, the more we will be able to collaborate and the faster we will be able to move forward. So this screen grab was taken a few, um, two or three months ago. Um, at any point in time, this is what the airspace looked like um, on top of one of the busiest airports in the world, Dubai. And um, it was just a snapshot. So there's a lot of movement going on. Um, while I say that, we have African problems that we need to address with African research conducted by researchers, whether they're visiting from abroad or whether they are local. Um, the rest of the world cannot follow an elitist approach and say that they have nothing to do with Ebola. It is, of, it is crucial for them, should there be an outbreak, to work with Africa to resolve this outbreak and to contain it because of people on the move. People get onto an airplane, um, their disease, um, they, try to con they try to monitor it, people entering into a country, but it can happen that that disease is um, then, sp then spreads to the rest of the world. So therefore, the rest of Ebola being um, 
originating from Africa, they would look to us as being the experts in Ebola. So what research do we produce on Ebola? What um, data do we have available on Ebola? And that's just one simple example. Um, when the Ebola outbreak occurred for the first time in 2014, um, 2015 in West Africa, the World Health Organization declared it an emergency and they called on governments all over to please um, make available funding and um, send researchers, um, invest money to, to try and resolve this crisis. So many initiatives across the world came um, and, they try, and they collected data from the local people. Um, and they, they documented it, they curated it, but after this outbreak was contained, that first outbreak, what happened? Those researchers and those initiatives left the continent along with their data. Now we all know how expensive research is, how expensive collecting data is. We cannot afford repeating the same research over and over just to come to the same conclusions. We need to build on existing research and in make, um, make progress. Another concern was that the people from which the data was collected were collected never benefited, while it was their right um, to benefit from it. And nowadays, there's a distrust, a fear, um, and lack of communication from um, aid groups. Um, sorry, the aid groups that came to the continent have. Um, alienated communities in the De Democratic Republic of Congo, leading some people to spurn treatment and even attack treatment centers. They do not want to work with these people coming from all over the world, uh, exploiting them and exploiting their data while they are not benefiting from it um, through open access. Um, what this is leading to is that Africa and um, Professor Bauer mentioned that, is that we need a continental, and apart from requiring a national approach, we also need a continental approach, a continental, uh, a collaborative initiative on continental level. And in 2006, the Department of Science and Innovation, or Department of Science and Technology, um, requested ASAF to conduct a landscape study to understand what is happening on this continent of ours. Um, our continent is vast. We are not well connected. Um, there are so many initiatives going on. At the same time, there are so many skeletons. Um, money is invested in the continent, but when those um, investors leave or those funders, when the funding ends, and that project comes to an end. What's left is a skeleton, and the people struggle to maintain it because of a lack of funding and commitment from governments. Um, so this landscape study was a first step towards aligning with what is happening in the rest of the world. Um, a continental platform bringing all science activities, all open science, all open access, activities, repositories, um, scholarly journal publications, data repositories, etc., cetera, um, together under one umbrella, aligning activities, sharing resources. So uh, the initial name um, with, uh, which we assigned was the African Open Science Platform, which is a missing p um, part of a puzzle, but in Europe, we have the European Open Science Cloud. In China, we have a CST Cloud. Australia, the ARDC. In the US, the NSF. In Canada, Compute Canada. And in the UK, the JISC um, platform. And um, Professor Bauer also mentioned JISC. So that's what the African Open Science Platform envisions for Africa, um, because we need to collaborate with fellow Africans as well. Collaboration can only happen if research and data are shared and are openly accessible. There's an African proverb which is so relevant to, to doing science. If you want to go fast, um, go alone. If you want the success to be your own individual success. If University of Free State want to be and beat all other universities, of course, they will um, um, go alone. But if we talk about transformative agreements in publishing, um, 
pool, a pool in which all universities come together and put their monies in together, might just um, do the trick. But if you want to go far, go together. So we need more collaboration amongst us as universities, as research institutions, um, science councils, etc., so that we can go far and have a bigger impact. What is open science and um, why are we talking about this? Open science is the practice of science in such a way that others can collaborate and contribute. It's more than just open access to research articles. Um, when they collaborate and contribute, the research data, the lab notes, and other research processes and outputs are freely available and the terms that enable reuse, redistribution, and reproduction of the research and its underlying data and methods. An open research publication is powerful, but what is even more powerful in this data-driven environment in which we find ourselves in, data and digital is not, are not gonna go away. Um, what's even more powerful is the data underlying the research. Um, because once a researcher has exhausted um, one data set, there might be other researchers which can find um, it useful to, to build on further research or to combine that data sets with other data sets in other disciplines. So um, there's, it, it, there's far more opportunity um, um, when it comes to data, to exploit that data and to, to innovate. Um, but the data in Africa also not openly accessible. So after that outbreak of 2000, that early, that first outbreak in the Congo, the, the researchers published this paper, Data Sharing, Make Outbreak Research Open Access, where they called for researchers working on outbreaks to embrace a culture of openness, and they documented some of the, the challenges they experienced as far as data concerns. Um, they found that the data were not shared um, fast enough. When there's an outbreak, there's no time. Um, you need e the data now, immediately. You don't have months and months and year to, years to wait for it to be published, like we would often do with a research article. Often they found that there we were gaps in the data. The data sets were not complete. Um, they were a lack, um, there was a lack of adherence to international standards. Um, so making it questionable, can the data be trusted? Um, how was it collected? Um, uncertainty about IP rights and absence of patient consent um, in health data specifically, it's very important to, to get obtain the consent of those people from whom you collect the data um, to get their permission um, and approval to, to use it for research purposes and explain to them why it's being used. So these were some of the challenges um, they experienced. Um, and it expands to, to other areas. And, um, and, and a, a challenge in agriculture, for example, is that big players, big farmers, use data to form. They base their predictions, their farming techniques, on um, previous occurrences, on previous trends, while the small farmers form blindly. Um, they just act on intuition. So Colru is a Kenya organization um, which launched an app to help farmers run avocado agribusinesses. All farmers, farmers um, you don't need to be a researcher. Um, as a farmer, farming there on your land, you need access to, to good quality data. Um, speaking to that question, open for whom? Everybody should have access um, to research and, um, and the underlying data. Um, a lack of access to reliable weather data is hurting African farmers. Another research article, or article which was published in the conversation um, confirming um, the previous article. Um, farmers not knowing what to expect, um, what the data collected is saying about the region in which they form, not being informed, not being educated, not knowing how to interpret the data. 
Um, also in South Africa, a problem which is very close to, to all of us, the land debate is clouded by a misrepresentation and lack of data. How can we as a country come up with policies if we do not have proper data? Because the evidence is in the data. Without data, what you say is merely an opinion, in the words of Edward Jennings, a, a statistician. So data, key in a world where we are surrounded with fake and um, trust issues, etc. And important that we maintain trust in science, uh, because our science is conducted with taxpayers' monies. And if they can no longer trust the science we do, um, how, how would they feel about contributing their taxes to, to, to science? So um, something we need to keep in mind. Another example from Africa is in Egypt. Um, in collaboration with, um, between e Ethiopia and Egypt, Ethiopia busy building a Renaissance dam, a huge dam, um, which might cut off water um, from Egypt. And Egypt is already a water scarce country. Can you imagine if this is to happen? So Kevin Wheeler, um, an environmental change institute, um, my environmentalist at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. Um, according to him, transparency over information and the development of effective data sharing and communication platforms are crucial, especially for this process, this negotiation process, to be peaceful, because the Third World War might just be, just as well be, because of a shortage of water. Can you see how close it is to us? Um, real problems faced by um, for Africans, which we need to address. Um, another challenge is that research should be reproducible. In this article um, published in 2018 in Nature, evaluating the replicability of social science experiments in nature and science between 2010 and 2015, replications of 21 high-profile social science findings demonstrate a challenge for reproducibility and suggest solutions to improve research credibility. Eight of the 21 studies failed to find significant evidence for the original finding, and the replication effect sizes were about 50% smaller than the original studies. So what does it say about the quality of research we conduct? In South Africa, we are very much focused on how many articles we publish, whether those articles have an impact, whether it benefits the people, is of no concern for us. We're just interested in publish as, publishing as many articles possible in the DHET approved lists so that we can generate more um, monies for our university and maintain um, the status quo. Well. Um, furthermore, there's also the question of should we open or should we keep it closed? Um, Data bringing power, but also responsibility, and open data offers risks and rewards for conservation. So it's a tricky situation. What do you do? Um, this example of this parrot was from, uh, from, is from Australia, where um, the policymakers decided that classifying data would help keep pouches, enthusiasts, who might use information to track and disturb the creatures away. So rather keep the data closed. Don't tell anybody about where this um, endangered species was uh, found. But what happened when they declassified the data? That led to the discovery of at least three new populations. So um, you can see that um, the decisions we are confronted with when opening data. Um, we maintain the position that data should be as um, open possible and as close necessary. As part of a landscape study, and uh, we've been busy with working with open access for almost 20 years now. Um, we've started with open access repositories, um, we've made huge progress in South Africa. All the research intensive universities have research repositories where they preserve or curate second copies of their research output. Um, 
And we've also, um, so 174 institutional repositories are registered on open door across the continent. In South, South Africa has the most. Um, then on the continent, we have 200 open access DOAJ listed journals, of which the most also in South Africa. Um, Egypt also had quite a number until uh, Hunda, oh, what was, um, who, I'm not sure um, what the name is, I've got it now, but they moved. It was a huge publishing house that moved from Egypt um, back to London. Then there's 34 open access policies registered on raw map. There's 24 data repositories registered on Ray3 data, while our landscape study identified 66 plus. So there's lots of work to be done in terms of getting those data repositories compliant with international standards so that we can um, demonstrate trust in the research, the data we have collected. Only one data repository, and that's the one at UCT, um, Data First, has been assigned the core trust seal, adhering to international um, requirements for a trusted data repository. So hopefully as an outcome of this landscape um, study, we will be working. ASAF is now compiling and preparing a proposal to work with all data repositories on the continent to up the quality and to adhere to all the requirements a good trusted data repository should adhere to. Um, as part of a landscape study, we've also um, aligned those data repositories with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the Square Kilometre Array is a, a success story for, um, for South Africa and for Africa. The African SKA Consortium consists of Botswana, Ghana, Kenya, Madagascar, Mauritius, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, and Zambia. We have South Africa actively um, participating. And um, this array of telescopes already collecting masses of big data. When I tried to access the data the other day, um, they simply had it on a website, this big data set file without any metadata assigned to it, without any um, retrieval tools. So there's opportunities for us as librarians to, to make a difference, to curate that data. Um, this image is um, very exciting, our, the meerkat that was built here on our continent and uh, in South Africa. This image shows the central regions of our galaxy with a wealth of never-before-seen features, as well as a clearer view of previously known supernova remnants, star-forming regions, and radio filaments. So science conducted in South Africa and Africa putting us on the map and demonstrating that we are equal players as far as science concerns. Although astronomy is not an, um, an SDG, the data can also benefit other um, areas, or other disciplines. What's even more exciting is that science can also benefit communities. And that's why we are saying open access, open science should benefit all. Um, so the SKA making its data openly accessible. But um, add to this that three million rand has been spent on catering and a four, further four million rand on transport in the area since construction began in 2012, benefiting the local service providers, the community, um, providing jobs, creating jobs, which, is much ne which are much needed in our country. 107 locals have been employed by the South African Astronomical Observatory between 2015 and 2017, and it's expanding. New jobs are um, being created, titles we've never seen before. Um, and the ESCA, according to Rob Adam, the director of the ESCA, um, electricians have been trained or are being trained boiler makers, fitters and turners and people splashing the fiber, fiber that carries the signal from the satellites through the computers that fiber is being splashed by people from the local community. Can you see this collaboration amongst science and the ordinary people, the non-scientists? So as far as African investments in um, science and ICT concern, unfortunately it's very low. 
Um, with, according to the NECA 2018 Sustainable Development Report, with low levels of organization or of funding of many science systems in Africa, Kenya and South Africa are the closest to the African Union's target of investing at least 1% of its annual GDP in research and development. Um, Kenya and South Africa at the, high, uh, at the top investing only 0.8% of its annual GDP in research and development. It's, it's incredibly low compared to the developing con developed countries. And the R&D expenditure of 24 out of the 54 AU registered countries are unknown. Congo, one of them. <laughs> so um, I hope you get a sense of what is happening on the continent and that there's a lot of work to do. We can move forward as a country, as South Africa, but we cannot afford to create and increase the digital divide between us and the rest of Africa. We need to collaborate. There is some political willingness in the form of National Academies of Science, 26 countries having National Academies of Science. Um, the R&D expenditure between 0.5 and 0.8 percent with about 12 countries. And then countries with ministries of science, technology and innovation, 25. Not all countries in Africa have ministries of science, technology and innovation. It's not a priority for all of them. So we've, um, where you see the, the dots, that's where most of our activity is happening. And we regard these countries as, as champions towards taking the African Open Science Platform forward. But we have other challenges, such as internet, um, internet um, censorship. Um, 20 governments, luckily not South Africa, but 20 governments applied some form of internet censorship 45 times since 2001, of which 36 times were shutdowns related to anti-government related protests. If the people are upset with the um, government, it spreads like a wildfire through social media and next thing, government cuts off the internet access. So when these countries, 10 countries are currently experiencing conflict related to political, military and Islamic forces, we have these challenges with no interest in science. Not all countries are a democratic, uh, fully three countries. Um, 22 countries are not free. Only 10 are free of the 54, and 22 are regarded as partly um, free countries. 48 of the 54 countries scored be below 50 on a scale of 100 on the Corruption Perceptions Index scale, and only six countries scored above 50. That is really concerning. Um, the Africa Infrastructure Development Index rated 46 countries below 15 on a scale of 100, and only eight countries higher from 50. So the infrastructure needs attention, especially the um, ingrains, the internet connectivity, the bandwidth, etc. 24 countries are ranked by the UN Development Index in the low human development country and 20 countries in the medium. None of us on the um, high, um, high level. So this is just a visualization of countries where internet shutdowns occurred. The blow, blue countries, sorry for Africans. Um, the gray areas are the areas where there are potential champions to take the African Open Science Platform, this continental initiative forward, um, which is promising. And you can see uh, mostly um, very much concentrated in the, land, the landlocked countries or the countries to the inland struggling with um, moving forward and having these challenges. So according to this article from um, um, to, um, 22 October 2019, um, A4AI is an initiative of the Web Foundation by Tim Berners-Lee, the um, who was the founder of the internet. Um, Africans face the most expensive, expensive internet charges in the world. Um, we are the continent that can afford it the least. Affordable internet will be the, will open a way for us to advance what 
and empower people to advance science, to empower the people on the street. If we can get that right, it would be major for this country. Um, so the prices are too expensive for all but the wealthiest few, increasing the digital divide once again, um, which is a concern. As you know, research institutions rely heavily on NRENs. We cannot afford the very expensive prices of uh, private in, um, internet service providers. So the NRENs, um, National Research Educational Networks, connecting um, research networks on the continent so that we can have increased collaboration. So in um, the Asian part, only four connected. In the Western part, only three connected. And in the Ubuntu Alliance, 10 connected, while six not yet connected. So 17 connected and in total, and 19 not connected, although they have NRENs, um, and a few without NRENs. And this is what our connectivity look like on the con it looks like on the continent. These NRENs are connected. Data transfer can happen across these um, countries and across these borders. The submarine cables are reaching the coastal countries um, easily and it's internet readily accessible. So once again, the inland country is struggling with infrastructure. Um, but the African Connect uh, 3 project promising and hoping to also connect those countries um, not this far connected. And similar to the European Open Science Cloud platform, um, we do not want to build the future African Open Science Platform from scratch. There are many initiatives going on on the continent. Um, you have a repository at the Free State University. You have a journal publication platform where you publish your own journals. And that, that is something all universities on the continent should embrace, publishing their own high quality open access journals, publishing their own research, taking it through stringent review processes. Um, so eventually bringing all those small initiatives across the continent together under this big umbrella on a national level and then all the national initiatives slotting into this bigger African Open Science Platform. So according to Catherine Stieva and similar to your, your ask, I ask um, We'll be starting from what members of the community worked in the last years. Inclusiveness is going to be critical, especially in regions whose voice has not been heard enough so far. So key on um, as my last slide, key to the future OSP would be um, open access, open data, open science, so that there can be more collaboration among countries, institutions, projects, researchers, sharing very expensive resources. Um, so that there's a free flow of data, research, and knowledge. Trust, very important. If you do not trust another country, how can you work with him? If you do not trust a researcher, of course you're not going to work with that researcher. So building trust relationships were key to, was key to this African Open Science Platform initiative, um, openness, transparency, um, and trust is when Others know you have their best interest at heart, and not because of a profit so they can make from you, your research. So do you trust the profit-making um, organizations or publishers? Um, that's a question you can answer for yourself. Um, but African, the African Open Science Platform will be a government-led, we hope, but it will be a government-led initiative supported by governments on the African continent. Um, we're funding from the World Bank, hopefully, potential funding from the World Bank. We're in the process of sourcing funder, funding and um, submitting funder proposals. It should be research-driven. Um, important that the data and the resources be brought to the researchers, the infrastructure be brought to the researchers and to the data where the data um, are generated. It's important the project has now come to an end, but we need to keep momentum. Um, we, require, we need strong leadership across um, the continent, uh, built on the tacit knowledge we've built up over the three years, and hopefully it will become a reality. 
Um, this uh, initiative aligns with the Science, Technology and Innovation Strategy for Africa 2024 and also with the, sorry for the um, draft picture, but the actual white paper by the Department of Science in, and Innovation has been released and in that white paper, um, which um, will be followed by a policy. Um, the Department of Science Innovation emphasizes the importance of open access, open science and open data. So whatever we do on a national level um, between the DHET, the DSI, it needs to align. Um, and um, together we can just uh, strengthen our own position. So on this note, thank you very much for this opportunity. Mm -hmm.